Well, welcome back to the second half. I'm delighted to see that you're still here. <laughs> Studying God's ways and his plans is not a simple thing. I have found nothing that God does to be simple. Oh yes, things can appear very simple on the surface, but once you really get into the anatomy of whatever it is you're looking at, even if it's something as simple as water, um, you begin to discover that Jesus is an incredible engineer. And the Father is just as capable of engineering as is the Son. But the beauty of this is that each has their unique role. And um, we read earlier from Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12 that God will bring in every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil, and we're not left wondering when this will happen. The book of Daniel tells us when this process begins. Daniel 7, 9, Daniel says, As I looked, thrones were set in place. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. And now the Ancient of Days here is a reference to the Father. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. No, he's not in a wheelchair. No, he's not in a hover round. These are, these are retinues of angels encircling the throne of God. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A little, a little girl asked me one time, what kind of chair was that where the wheels were on fire? In verse 10, a river of fire. Daniel is watching this scene unfold and as this retinue, a procession of angels are moving in toward this great vast assembly of hundreds of millions of angels, um, this procession of glorious beings looks like a river of fire. Have you ever seen time-lapse photography of the taillights of cars looking like trails of fire? That's, that's just a, a dim Example, I think of what Daniel was shown. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. The court was seated and the books were opened. Now, this is where the judgment of the dead is being described. All the angels of heaven are called together to this great convocation because God wants every angel to see how the judgment process works. There are no secrets. There is no hidden, under-the-table shenanigans going on in God's government. His government is totally transparent. He has nothing to hide. And all the angels are called in to begin to watch this awesome process. And the interesting thing about it is that the judge finds himself in the worst case of conflict of interest ever imposed on anyone in, at any time in the entire universe. And here's the conflict of interest. Jesus must uphold the government and the law of God. 
And at the same time, Jesus loves every sinner so much, he was willing to give up his eternal life to save him. That's why love is the balance of justice and mercy. A lot of people think that mercy and love are synonyms. But that's not true. The God of love who was willing to die on the cross to save us from our sins is the same God of love who will destroy the wicked at the end of the thousand years. Same God, same character, same love, because love is a balance between justice and mercy. And if you've been a parent, you know what I'm talking about. You raise a child, and if he only knows the stern hand of justice, he will grow up and be rebellious toward authority. If you, grow, if you raise a child and he only knows mercy and, and indulgence, you, you raise a spoiled brat. The two extremes. Love is the balance between justice and mercy. And so the one who has the most serious conflict of interest in the entire universe is put in a position to open the books and begin going through the records. I do not envy that job. Oh, it tears his heart out to condemn someone to eternal death. It tears his heart out to reject someone as a member of the eternal family. On the other hand, he understands that he cannot allow a defiant sinner to have a place in eternal life because that defiance would soon yield a thousand defiant followers. It's been proven true. While I'm thinking about it, I want to take you to a Bible text. Matthew 12, 31. And I want you to watch closely what Jesus said and how he said it. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now watch these words. Either in this age or... What? In the age to come. In other words, the same rules apply now as will, will, will apply for eternity. Now, what does it mean to speak against the Holy Spirit? Well, if the Holy Spirit comes to your heart and brings you a deep-seated conviction that something is right and true and you must do it, and you don't, you're in defiance. The Holy Spirit doesn't come with suggestions. <laughs> the Holy Spirit comes with conviction. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit only tries once or twice. He might try for years because God, the Holy Spirit, is as patient and long-suffering as is Jesus and the Father. Remember, they're one in purpose, plan, and action. When, when a person lives up to what he believes to be right and true and honorable in God's sight, even if he doesn't know the name of Jesus, God considers that person a child of the kingdom because... He is cooperating with the Spirit. There's only one sin that cannot be forgiven. Only one. And that is defiance.
Now, let me take you back for a moment. Lucifer and his angels rebelled against the Holy Spirit. And they were cast out of heaven on the basis of defiance. And instead of destroying Lucifer and his angels and just being rid of them, God in his infinite wisdom said, I'm going to allow Lucifer and the angels to live for a little while because I have a larger problem to solve. Let me take you back a little ways. God is love. And as a God of love, he offers the power of choice to all of his subjects. You see, love, the balance between justice and mercy, means that you are free to choose. You are free to choose whether you will serve God or not. You're free. Now, you're not free of the consequences of your choice, but you're free to choose. Once you drink a bottle of water, the consequences of what it's going to do inside of you, you've lost control. You have a choice whether to drink it. But after you drink it, you have no more choice over where it goes or what it does. (laughs) So it is. We have choice. We can choose whether to follow God and serve Him or we can choose not to. But we have no control over the outcome of our choice. The choice is ours to make. The consequences are determined by law. If you plant watermelon seed, watermelon will grow. Whatever you sow, you must reap. That's the law. It cannot be violated. Galatians 6, God says, he cannot be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, he will reap. Can't escape that. So God allowed Lucifer and his angels to live. They had the power of choice. And Lucifer and his angels chose to rebel. They chose to do it. One of the reasons, now this is not a direct text in the Bible, so I'm offering some of my own commentary here. So please take this with a grain of salt. Many times in my seminars, I'm, I'm, I'm more technical than a lot of people appreciate because We'll go through, you know, 50, 75 texts. But um, tonight, I want to just sort of give you a concept to think about. I believe that one of the arguments that Lucifer used to mislead a third of heaven's angels. Now, we're not talking about dummies. We're talking about highly intelligent brilliant intellects. We're talking about angels who've lived for thousands of years. And one of the arguments that I think that Lucifer used so successfully against God to cause a third of heaven to rebel against God was God's law concerning sin. And here's the law. The day you sin, you die. I believe that law is an everlasting, eternal law. And that law was imposed upon Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you go back and look at Genesis 2, you will find that when God spoke to Adam and Eve, He said, look, of all the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely eat die. The wages of sin is death by execution. Adam and Eve were to be executed the day they sinned. Because the wages of sin is death by execution. Speedy execution. Not 30 years languishing on death row. The wages of sin is not death by cancer. The wages of sin is not death by laryngitis or a high fever or war or an accident. That's not the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death by execution and that's why the wicked are executed at the 
end of the thousand years. That's why Jesus was executed on the cross. The wages of sin is death by execution. No lamb in the Old Testament died on the altar of old age. They were all executed because the wages of sin is death by execution. And Lucifer used the argument, we don't have any choice around here. Step over the line, we're history. What kind of a God is that? Well, no one had, had, had seen evil. No one had the knowledge of good and evil. So Lucifer, using a, a challenge to God's law, found a way to create doubt that God was love. I cannot find a better explanation in all the Bible than this for Understanding how a third of heaven's intelligent, holy beings, having no predisposition toward rebellion and sin, perfect in all their ways, I can find no better explanation for their rebellion, choosing to lose faith in God, than this argument. And this is the same law that was imposed on Adam and Eve. Now, obviously, the day Adam and Eve sinned, God did not kill them. There's a reason why. And the reason is found in the book of Psalms 2, verse 7. Instead of picking up the sword, the executor, incidentally, is the creator. The one who gives life is the one who takes life. Instead of picking up the sword to slay Adam and Eve, Jesus ran to the Father and he said, Father, Adam and Eve did not sin defiantly. There's hope here. Eve was deceived by the serpent and Adam, because of his great love for Eve, sinned. In other words, that would be third degree, not first degree, premeditated. And on the basis that this is not a defiant sin on either case, like as with Lucifer and his angels, I'm willing to surrender to the plan of salvation I'm willing to give over myself and to give up my eternal life that they might have what belongs to me. And John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The day that Adam and Eve sinned, this took place, Psalm 2-7. I will de proclaim the decree of the Lord. Okay. The book of Psalms has some prophetic utterances recorded in it. This was given by the Holy Spirit through the Holy Spirit to David and he wrote these utterances so that as we study these utterances we may understand what has happened in the great cosmic picture of the plan of salvation. And on the day that Adam and Eve sinned, the Father said to Jesus, He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. The Hebrew word for son is ben, B-E-N. And it means subject. You are my subject. Today I have become your boss. <laughs> Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth, 
Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. Lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The day that Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus ran to the Father and laid down himself and said, Father, let me die in their place. Let me die in their place. I will give them my eternal life. And if you are satisfied with my sacrifice, then you decide whether or not to resurrect me from the dead. It's in your hands. And the Father said, Oh my, how generous! I wouldn't give your life for a thousand of these worlds. How many of them have you already made? About 40 million, okay. I wouldn't give your life for all 40 million of them. You're not, you're far more valuable than 40 million worlds that you've made. You can make 40 million more. Boy, the father had to struggle. Conflict of interest. (laughs) Ah, Don't you hate it? For God so loved the world. Let me tell you something. I want to show you that John 3.16 has a side to it that most people do not understand. If I were going to translate John 3.16 into the vernacular, I would say it this way. The Father loved justice so much that he could find no other way to save man than to kill Jesus. Most people not understanding how sin works and God's laws work They say, well, why couldn't he just say, okay, you guys, now cut it out. Let's just forget this happened. Let's just just forget that this took place. Let's just go on down the road and everybody be happy. Why couldn't God, why why did he have to kill Jesus to save us? Why couldn't he just forgive us and go on? Isn't God love? Can he forgive? (laughs) Well, in God's economy... Every sin, every deed, everything lives in a balance. In physics, we say that there is the law of action and reaction. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. There's judicial equilibrium. Everything hangs in balance, justice and mercy. The day that Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus went to the Father, and the Father, after his struggle, gave up his son. And you know, the story of Abraham and Isaac is a little tiny parallel of what the Father had to go through And he wanted one human being on earth to understand that sacrifice. So he took a man who had made a big mess, who is now, you know, a hundred years old or more. And he's got his only child, the one he coveted and loved and longed for forever. And he takes him to Mount Moriah and says, kill him, make him a sacrifice. And oh. The reason Abraham is called a friend of God is because he trusted God. And Jesus trusted the Father like Abraham trusted Jesus. Well, a stay of execution was granted. Adam and Eve were not slain that day and that stay of execution is still intact this very night. It's still in place. But it's soon to be removed. When Jesus is taken out of the way, the great tribulation begins. The wrath of God begins. The 
intercession on behalf of the world, the, the daily intercession of Christ in heaven on behalf of this planet will be lifted and God's wrath will begin. And that's what causes the great tribulation. And that's why we read last night in uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 19, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of what? Wrath. Because the vision concerns what? The appointed time of the end. Excuse me, I thought you were watching the Bible. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. The great tribulation is the first phase of God's wrath. And that brings us to the idea and to the understanding of judgment. Okay. We have two living people, number three and number four. And God is going to take all of humanity through a great testing time. Number three and number four, I've chosen these two numbers to represent those who follow the Holy Spirit and those who are in defiance of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Knowledge does not save us. You may believe there is one God, you do well. The devil believes and trembles. Knowledge doesn't save. What saves us is faith in God that produces action. I'll say more about that in just a minute. I want to show you this. So we have number three and number four. And these two people, let's say that, that these are the only, only two people on earth. They are put through a very difficult testing time and the judgment of the world, the judgment of the living takes 1,260 days. 1,260 days. We looked at that last night on our big long chart. And during the testing time, you know there's going to be the mark of the beast. Well, the mark of the beast is a test. It's a test to see who will be defiant? It's a test to see who will receive something that they know is evil beyond any shadow of doubt. But they will do it in order to save themselves. When it comes down to saving yourself, the carnal heart who lives for nothing larger and higher than itself will do whatever it takes to save self. That's the way of the carnal heart. But the heart that is born again realizes that his heart and his life belong to God. And if God wants to take it now, he can have it now. Their submission and surrender to the will of God, to a higher authority than to the demand of the carnal heart. So God is going to put the whole world in a very difficult testing time to separate the sheep from the goats. And at the end of the great tribulation, at the second coming, the Bible says a sword comes out of the mouth of Jesus. Can you, can you see the sword? I, wanna, I, want, I want you to look at my artwork there. <laughs> <laughs> in the book of Revelation chapter 19 it's described as a sword that comes out of his mouth with which he strikes down the wicked Jesus kills all the wicked people at the second coming so get this once the great tribulation begins at the 1335th day you'll either be on your way out of here or you'll be on your way into the ground you might say grounded and the Saints at the second coming will be caught up in the air with those who are resurrected. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 4, the living do not precede the dead. The dead go first. They are called up first. And then we which are alive and remain are then called up together to, with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so there they are with Jesus. And then at the end of the thousand years, 
You see, there's Abel, who was the first man to die. And then number three here represents the person who came out of the great tribulation and had surrendered to the Holy Spirit and refused the mark of the beast. And you can see they are in the holy city. And then Jesus resurrects Cain, who is number two, and all the wicked who lived during the great tribulation. And then the wicked are executed by fire that falls from God out of heaven. That's the mechanics of the process. That's the mechanics of it. It's not too hard to understand. Okay, look at this. The Bible does not say that a person will be judged according to his faith. We have looked at six texts that indicate we will be judged by our actions, by what we did, what we have done. So why does the Bible say it this way if salvation comes by faith? James says, James 2.14, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? No. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, friend. Keep warm and be well fed. But does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead, worthless. James 2.18, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith, James says, without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Martin Luther hated the book of James so badly he almost left it out of the German Bible. (coughs) Excuse me. The reason for it is that Martin Luther had been so wrapped up in deeds and works to be saved that there was no room for faith. And when he read the book of James, oh, it seemed to be tearing down everything that he, would, that he had discovered. You know how the pendulum swings from one side to the other. But let me assure you, dear friends, there's balance. There's deeds. There's faith. They work together. Now, will we be saved by our deeds? No. No. Will you be saved without your deeds? No. (laughs) Your deeds reflect who you are, what you believe, what you have absorbed, and what the Spirit is telling you. Now, I don't know what the Spirit may be telling you or what He may be confronting you on, I don't know what the Holy Spirit is saying to you about anything. I'm not your judge, and I can't judge you. I can only inspect your fruit. By their fruit, Jesus said, you will know them. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. So, the only thing I can do is make observation about others. I don't know what convictions you may have, but whatever convictions you may have, I honor them. I respect them because that is between you and God. I'm not here to tell you what you should believe or not believe. That is between you and God. I'm simply a teacher and you can flunk the class if you want. What, what, what difference does it make? I can't save you. It is... Our joy 
to absorb the Spirit and to allow the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts. Now, the Spirit will start in the most unusual and unlikely places to test us. I remember when I was in college, I hated school. And um, whenever I got an opportunity, I would cheat my way through classes because I hated to study. And I remember I was, um, I was in the third time I had to take Western civilization. I had a hard time with history. And I was heading for failure again. And so I figured that the only way for me to take care of this and get rid of this monkey off my back was to get to the classroom a little early and get cha Fred's chair in a little better position. Because Fred and I were going to take this exam together and he didn't know it. <laughs> Fred was a pre-med student, very sharp guy, always made excellent grades. So... I got to, to the classroom about five minutes early. I sat in my chair. I studied the situation, and I got Fred's chair lined up just where I thought it ought to be. The teacher passed out the exams, and the test began, and away we went. I let Fred go first. <laughs> Fred finished his exam. He went up to the desk, turned it in, and went out the door. I thought I'd better look over my answers just one more time. Then I turned mine in and I walked out. I was so excited. I'm going to pass. Sure enough. Next day I went to look at the final grades that were posted on the door. And my custom, for two reasons, I always went to the bottom of the list. My name begins with W, which alphabetically, you know, is near the bottom always. And the other reason, of course, my scores were always near the bottom anyway. <laughs> and I started looking, and I kept looking up and up and up and up and up and up. And wow, I didn't see my name. And I kept going up and up and up and up. And lo and behold, I had finished second in the class. Fred had finished third. Fred's arm covered up a part of the test I couldn't see. And I had guessed at those answers and got uh, beat Fred by one point. <laughs> you, can't, uh, you can't imagine the happiness that was in my heart. Western civilization, goodbye. Well, you know, I thought I had done well. Time went on. I went in the army, spent a year in Vietnam, came home, got married, had a child, began working. But the Holy Spirit hadn't forgotten. <laughs> I went through some experiences that were difficult, and the Holy Spirit began to work in my heart. And I began to feel and sense a real need for something more in my life than what I had. And um, through some post-traumatic stress and some help that came to me, I didn't know in those days what it was, but uh, uh, through a, a kindly person helping me and teaching me about prayer, I found the Lord, or I allowed Him to find me, I should say, and wow, it changed my life. I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. And when I did that, the Holy Spirit said, Now, oh boy, this is good, Larry. You've got so much to make right, it's going to overwhelm you. <laughs> well, I shut that all out. I didn't want to hear about making things right. And the Holy Spirit said, Well, that's fine. You don't have to. You're in rebellion. You're defiant, because I'm telling you, you've got to make it right. Ooh. See, that's what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, is doing wrong, knowing full well it's wrong. Well, I put it off. I didn't want to do that. It's just humiliating to make things right. 
And I went along for a while, and then one day, the Lord has such a sweet way of putting the knife in your back. I, the Lord called me to the gospel ministry. And so here I am entering school to take the ministerial curriculum, and now the Lord's got me. Larry, you've got to take Western Civ for the fourth time. <laughs> Oh, I hate Western civilization. And I prayed about it, and I prayed about it, and the Lord said, there's nothing to pray about. You did wrong. Make it right. Nothing to pray about. Don't give me none of this run around. No, just make it right. And by the way, Larry, you stole some money here along the way when you were in college. You need to pay that back. You know, you need to make your wrongs right as, as far as you can remember because if you don't make restitution, you will make restitution in the end. I wrote a letter to my history teacher and I said, Dear Mr. Greenleaf, I don't know if you remember, but I did so well on that final exam in Western Civ. I finished at the top of the, almost at the top of the class. But I cheated. And I'm here to tell you that uh, I cheated and I'm very sorry. And if you will revoke the grade that you gave me 10 years ago, I'm willing to accept the failure and to take the class again because I'm in college now. A few weeks went by, I didn't hear anything. And I said, well, Lord, I did, I did what I did, what I was supposed to do. And the Holy Spirit said, well, you've got nothing to worry about. Just sign up for Western Civ. So I did. Got, I, I enrolled, got ready to go, and the letter came. Dear Larry, no, I don't remember that incident. I wasn't watching to see who was cheating, although I knew it was rampant. But he said, you know, the important thing about history is that we learn from our mistakes. And if you've learned that, you've learned probably more about Western civilization than anybody else. <laughs> he says, as far as I'm concerned, the grade will stand. Good luck to you. I was truly happy. But that's not the end of the story. A year later, it was time to graduate. And they called me into the registrar's office and said, Larry, you can't graduate. You have no American history. And you can't graduate from college without American history. And I said, well, what do I have to do? And they said, well, we're going to have to postpone your graduation because you've got to go to summer school and take it. And I said, well, what about the CLEP exam? And they said, well, in the hundred years of this college, nobody has ever taken that test and passed it. And judging by your history scores, we don't think you ought to waste your money. <laughs> that was the academic dean. You know how they always sound so. Well, I said, I don't have a choice. I've got to get out of here and get into the Lord's work. And so I ordered the test. I took, I, it came. I went to the library. I sat down to take the test. The lady told me I had two hours. There were 180 questions. I began reading, and I've lived in the United States my whole entire life, and there was nothing on that exam that I had ever heard about. <laughs> Not one thing. I'm serious. I got to the back of the exam. I saw that I had wasted my money. And I started at the back of the exam. And it's all multiple choice. And I just filled in all of the blanks just as fast as I could. And within about 15, less than 15 minutes, I turned the test in to the lady and said, well, that's it. She said, oh, wow. We've never seen anybody take a test that fast. <laughs> I said, I answered every question. And I went home and I told Shirley, I said, well, I guess I'm not graduating. 
God has something else in mind, and I'm okay with that. I truly am. If that's God's will for me, that's all right. I only want to be in God's will. Not, I don't want God in my will. I want to be in His will. It was two days before graduation, and I hadn't even ordered my cap and gown. I wasn't going to march. There was no point in a cap and gown. It was a Saturday night. I went to the mailbox, opened this strange-looking letter from the CLEP people, and in the second semester, I had earned a C+. Plus and in the first semester, I'd gotten a B minus. Whoa. I went to the car. And I said to Shirley, I know why God did this. I know why God has blessed me. It was because I made it right. I made it right in Western Civ, and he blessed me in American history. He gave me, he saved me. He's my savior. You only need a savior when things are beyond you. You only need a savior when you can't fix it yourself. And the good news from last night's study is that we have a savior. And the good news from tonight's study is that we have a judge that is a savior and he's fair. He will balance it out. He serves a tremendous conflict of interest. And I can assure you of this. If there is evidence in the record of your life that you are not defiant to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Savior will rescue you. There is no room in heaven for defiance, but heaven can contain every repentant sinner. Would you bow your heads? Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your precious word, which tells us of the dynamics that involve our salvation. And we understand a little about your great love, and how you balance out justice and mercy. We understand a few things about the Holy Spirit and his speaking to our hearts. And we know that he speaks for you, that he comes to us and that he impresses us to do what is right and honorable and holy and righteous. We're sinners. Please forgive us our sins and take from us any defiance and any rebellion that might be in our souls, that we might be fully surrendered and fully submissive to your will, just as Jesus was to yours, Father, is our prayer in your wonderful name tonight. Amen. Amen. Well, may God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow evening at 659.